It's great to see so many of you uh, tonight. I must confess I was a bit worried because I announced the, the talk a bit late this time and I saw oh, we'll be too late. Nobody will come. Well, how wrong I was. Uh, there are so many of you tonight, so it's lovely uh, to, to see you, to have you around. And um, it's my great pleasure uh, to, to welcome you to this autumn session. It's starting to be dark. I had to draw the curtains because I thought it would uh, be um, dark by the end of the talk. So it's already dark here for me. And um, it's good to see that there is so much continued interest in the Aston Interpreters Network. It's uh, amazing to see how many of you want to, to learn more. So I've got uh, a little bit of good news to share with you, because as some of you may know, we are running those events with the support of uh, BVSC, Birmingham Voluntary Services uh, Committees, and um, that funding is running out at the end of the year, but I've been managed to find another little pot of money, which means that we will be able to, re to run session at least until June 24, and I'll try to find another pot of money uh, by then. So um, hopefully that will be um, time for us to share lots of interesting uh, discussion about the job of an interpreter. And uh, today, tonight, uh, we are touching to a topic we haven't discussed yet, which is the topic of interpreter safety. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Ken. Ken Paver has been a, a good friend of our network. He's been involved in one of the discussion session once. And Ken has had a, a long association with us at Aston University. He's been a visiting lecturer uh, at some point. So we've known him for, for quite a while. Ken is a trained and qualified interpreter with um, lots of experience in the job. Uh, despite his useful good looks, he's been in the business for over 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. So he's got a wealth of experience uh, and expertise to share with us. Um, Ken is working um, in certain topics that may be a bit different from the ones you're working in. He's uh, uh, a specialist on uh, nuclear plants and uh, interpreting in those con contexts. So when he will be talking about interpreter safety, um, it uh, it feels a bit uh, scary because we, we might be uh, in the kind of uh, emergency situation, nuclear radiation. So um, it might be a very exciting um, session here. I mean, the kind of thing Ken will be sharing with us tonight is some kind of toolboxes, as he called them, of resources he's been able to tap into while he was uh, doing his job as an interpreter. And although you may work in different areas, uh, those toolbox may uh, prove very useful. So thank you very much, Ken, for sharing all your good tips with us. And without further ado, I will leave the floor to you. So you need to unmute first. You're still yeah. mute. Thanks, Emmanuel. Can you hear me now? <coughs> Thanks for the uh, introduction. I hope you can all see my uh, screen. Uh, as Emmanuel said, uh, my experience is in the nuclear industry. But what I've tried to do is put together a, a series of toolboxes which should be, which I hope will be applicable to your area, to different in, interpreting scenarios. That's the idea. So while I may talk a little bit about my experiences in the nuclear industry, I will also try and make sure that what I'm saying to you is applicable to the different scenarios in which you work. Um, interpreter safety is, a, a, I've been interested in that for a long time. I've worked over the years with, with ITI and with uh, the people that I work with in the nuclear industry on various issues around interpreter safety in various uh, inter for, for all interpreters, not just for, for the people I work with uh, on nuclear plants. Um, 
And the idea of, I, I get quite annoyed when people talk about health and safety going mad and people saying, oh, it's too much health and safety and so on. What I'm trying to, what I'm going to try and talk to you about today is how safety, we can incorporate safety into everything that we do as interpreters without building a, a complicated system, without making it complex, without adding anything onto what we do. We can take safety into consideration on a systematic basis to help us work more uh, safely and more effectively, of course. If we work more safely, we work more effectively. So um, the, what I'm hoping that I will get across to you today is an understanding of the different risk, risk factors that can affect your uh, performance and can affect your safety, as I've said to you, in various interpreting environments. Um, I'll talk to you about different toolboxes. I've got three or four toolboxes which you can use before, during and after assignments to help you mitigate the risks and to help you stay safe. And then I'll talk to you about what we call safety culture, something's very important in the nuclear industry, but which we can easily import into what we do as interpreters. And safety culture means actively, proactively taking safety into account and building into, into everything that we do. As I said, while keeping it simple, we don't need to create anything complex in terms of safety. We just need to think about safety when we're working so that we can help, help ourselves uh, stay safe. There will be time, as Emmanuel said, for uh, questions at the end. Um, so first of all, I'll talk to you about the factors which can affect your safety, affect your safety. They can be risk factors, whatever we want to call them. Secondly, then I'll go into the toolboxes. So before, during, after, the different things you can do, the different tools you can apply. Then I'll talk to you, I've got a series of photos which I used in, in, a, in a workshop in interpreter safety before, so we might not have too much time to spend on the photos, but I will show you those and they'll be available for you to see on the recording to help you think about how in different situations um, you would use your toolbox to assess your safety and to think about mitigations. It's important not to be afraid of the terminology. When we talk about mitigations, we mean things that we can do to reduce or eliminate risk. So we, we shouldn't be scared of terms like mitigations and terms like situational awareness. I'll talk to you about situational aware, awareness, which sounds very kind of, I don't know, military or sci-fi. And situational awareness is, is, is simply being aware of your situation. However, it is kind of very important that we, we are aware of our situation as interpreters, of course, when we're particularly in certain scenarios. So don't be afraid of the terminology that I'm going to use. Um, it's all relatively simple. I hope that you'll find that what I'm talking to you about will be relatively simple. At the end, I'll talk to you about safety culture and how it can benefit you. And then, as I say, we'll have time for some, for some questions at the end. So first of all, um, risk factors, factors which can affect your safety as an interpreter. Now, it's not always about interpreting at the top of a ladder like the person in that photograph there. It can often be about interpreting in an office scenario or in any kind of scenario that you're working in. There are always safety factors. There are always risk factors to take into account. Um, some of them are obvious. Things like noise. Obviously, noise can be a risk factor. It's important to bear in mind as well that I'll talk about that in the next slide. There are always mitigations for every risk factor. So for every risk factor, there should be a line of defense which you can say, this is the risk. I've decided this risk is here. Here's what I can do to mitigate it. The risk factor may be noise. Fairly straightforward to deal with in terms of changing location, using personal protective equipment, uh, indicating to the client that it's not suitable because it's too loud, you can't hear, and so on. There are the, you should For each of these, you should have a tool, which is your mitigation. Your physical mental condition, I'll talk to you about that in the, in when I talk about the preparation toolbox. The physical conditions in the workplace, again, the, some of these are fairly obvious and some of them are not so obvious. When we get up to the one about lack of language or specialist subject expertise, that's quite interesting. People often say to me, how can that affect your safety? That's because if you are uh, suitably what we call in the nuclear industry, SQUEP, suitab suitably qualified and experienced person, you're muted, Ken. Oh, you're back. It's happened on its own. I haven't actually, I'm not actually touching the mouse. I'll try and keep away from it. Um, so people ask me why a lack of language or specialist subject expertise can uh, affect your safety. It's because the better you are, the more prepared you are, the more uh, expertise you have, the better your, your training is. 
you will perform more effectively and you'll be more aware of safety issues. If you're stressed about the terminology, if you're stressed about the situation, if you're stressed about the subject matter, you'll be less likely to be aware of safety issues and you'll be less able to address them effectively. So all of these things uh, can be risk factors which you can, uh, which can uh, pose a safety risk and which can impact your safety. Um, I always talk to interpreters in nuclear plants about positioning. That's a really key one for us. If you work in an industrial environment, positioning where you can see the speaker's mouth, where you can hear them properly, where you're not standing in a risky situation like standing on, uh, on stairs or standing um, part way up a scaffolding ladder. Those kind of things are important, but they also apply in other scenarios. In lots of in, uh, interpreting scenarios, your positioning is important. So all of these things, as I've said, you can do your own checklist actually of risk factors once you when you do your, your risk assessment. Um, but I'm going to go on to the next slide, which this is this is useful for me. This is quite um, uh, uh, what the French would call parlant. It's quite eloquent. It shows me that each of these lines of defense is one of your mitigations against risk. And if it's if ineffective, it's got a hole in, then the uh, probability of an accident increases. And if all the holes line up, then you get an accident. You don't need to talk about the active failures and latent conditions. That's uh, specifically kind of a uh, industry related but these having these lines of defense in your mind is important now if we go along to um i'm going to skip on to a couple hit uh no sorry i've gone too far there uh the lines of defense can be they're the, basically the opposite of the risk factors we talked about before so you're interpreting training your mental health your physical health the briefing by the customer your situational awareness your experience your toolboxes that I'm going to be talking about, your personnel, personal protective equipment, it might be a hard hat, it might be hearing defenders, it might be eye protection, uh, cooperation with the customer, so the support from the customer, you've had a briefing with them just beforehand, you've had a safety discussion with them beforehand, all of these things can function as lines of defence. The customer will have organisational lines of defence, they may say in their organisation requirements, you have to have a, a signature, you have to have a key holder present, you have to have another person present when you're in this area, whatever. All of these things should contribute and can act as lines of defence against accidents. Just a quick note about your physical and mental condition, I'll talk to you about this in the preparation toolbox as well, but very briefly, this is obviously key. Again, going back to what I said before about your uh, training and experience, if you're in good physical and mental condition, you're much more likely to be able to identify a safety risk and much more likely to respond to it successfully. If you've had enough sleep, if you're an alcohol user, you need to be not drinking any alcohol at all, obviously on the day that you're working, but on previous days, you need to be careful with that. Things like caffeine intake, stress outside work, obviously it's very difficult to do that for many of us. Physical fitness, including things like your hearing and eyesight, et cetera, all of these things, can make a vital contribution to your safety in ways that we don't always realize. So the better prepared you are in physical and mental terms, the more likely you are to be safe. Um, that applies uh, for me when I'm on, on the nuclear side because I need to be relatively in relatively good physical condition because we're often climbing up and down things. So we go inside the radiation controlled area where it's very, very hot temperature wise and so on. Um, this is a quick one. This is not legal advice because I'm not a lawyer. But this is a quick slide to show you that you do have a right to be safe as an employee in the UK. As a person working in the UK, there are duties upon employers and upon people who are paying you to work to make sure that was the cat landing on my desk, that wobble, to make sure that you are safe and you have a duty to the people with whom you are working and for whom you are working to keep them safe as well. There are the AIC and FIT guidelines for those of you working more at international level, where they talk about interpreters having a right to protection and to medical and psychological assistance. And in terms of health and safety, that there are also standards for conference booths. Uh, there are two different standards. These are the 2016 versions, ISO 2603 and ISO 4043. Um, also important. So as I say, that's not legal advice, but that's the, the, the kind of framework in which we all work as interpreters. So this is the first toolbox. This is where I think is, this, this is the most important thing. As I said, these are things which I hope you'll be able to apply to your areas, irrespective of which area you work in as an interpreter. I've talked to you about being physically and mentally ready to work. Again, that's a really crucial contribution to your safety. 
An important toolbox is the safety briefing or safety training. I often have safety training when I'm going to be working in a nuclear plant. Obviously, you must follow these closely. These can provide you some really important information and really important tools which you need to know if you're going to be functioning safe, if you're going to be working safely. Customer requirements, they may not be directly related to safety, but they may give you some safety information. So any information the customer can give you, please listen to it carefully because it may be important for your safety. They may tell you about the client you're going to be working with. They may tell you about the number of clients you're going to be working with. They may tell you about the physical environment in which you're going to be working. All of these things may contribute to your safety. I've talked before about interpreting skills, techniques, and subject matter knowledge are up to date. If you're working confidently and comfortably and you're not stressed about the subject matter or your terminology or interpreting skills, your techniques, you're much more likely to function safely and to be able to identify and address a safety issue. If you do, it's a really important tool. If you do identify an issue before you start work, a safety issue where you think this is going to present a risk, this is going to be one of the risk factors we talked about before. It may be to do with the noise in the area you're going to be working. It may be to do with the fact that you're not comfortable with your position in the room in terms of distance from the client or proximity to the client or distance from the speaker. Please challenge all of these things before you start work. Uh, when, you, when challenging the customer, I always find that it's best to fun focus on the outcome. In other words, what will be achieved if you address the safety issue? You'll be, what will be achieved is that you'll be able to function correctly and, uh, and safely, and the client will be able to communicate. That's the thing to focus on when addressing things like this. When challenging safety issues, it's about making sure that you can work safely so that the, the, the clients can communicate. I've found that it's, not a, it's less effective to talk about letting the interpreter work, letting me do my work, allowing me to do my work. The interpreter doing their work is not an end in itself, unfortunately, but better off or worse, the end is the goal which the client has. Now that might be attending a court case, that might be carrying out a nuclear safety review, it might be communicating with a hospital patient. Those are the end goals and whether we are able to uh, whether they need us or not, we can be sometimes just a buffer and our uh, ability to perform our work is not an end in itself. Our ability to perform our work safely is an end in itself. So that's what we need to focus on. Not just let me do my work, but you need to, when we are challenging somebody on a safety issue, the client on a safety issue, we need to focus on the outcome. I'm not able to work safely, so therefore you will not be able to communicate. Always challenge calmly and professionally. I've seen Interpreters get very stressed about noise and get very grumpy. In my experience, again, that's a much less effective way of handling things. If you stay calm and you stay clearly that it's uh, there's a safety issue and the community clients will not be able to communicate without you if you can't work safely, that's the, that's the way to do it, in my opinion. So these are the tools you need before you start work. There are more. It's very important to co conduct a kind of uh, assessment of the risk your workplace environment. Now, again, this doesn't need to be complicated. You need to have a quick glance around. If you're in a booth, you need to check things like electrical safety. You need to check where the emergency exits are. You need to check that the you can actually physically fit in the booth. It's not overcrowded. You need to check it's not too hot, that the hearing, the sound is okay so that you're not going to damage your hearing so that you can see where the speakers are and so on. That applies to your environment wherever you're working as interpreter. You can have a checklist if you like, you can have a mental checklist, but don't make it complicated because that will add to your burden, add to your stress. And as we've seen, adding to your stress makes you less able to function safely. So assess the workplace environment, identify any potential hazards, discuss them with the customer if necessary, as we've said before the start of work. The customer in many cases will have provided their own mitigation. So that might be in my case, it would be hearing defenders, eye protection, uh, a hard hat, overalls, gloves, safety shoes, and so on. The customer should already have conducted their own risk assessment. They will know where the emergency exits are. They will be able to tell you emergency exit information, what to do in the event of an emergency. If there are any extra things you do, you need to do to mitigate the risks, either because the customer hasn't identified them or because the customer hasn't thought about them because they don't think about interpreters, then again, do that beforehand. Also importantly, even if you've worked somewhere before and you're very familiar with it, always do a quick check anyway, something may have changed. 
there may be some a new factor. There may be a new factor related to the particular client you're working with. If you're working in a court situation or a police interview room or an asylum interview room, or an immigration interview room, there may be factors related to uh, the actual current situation, which have nothing to do with the environment. So even if you worked somewhere before, always take the chance to look at the potential risk factors, think about how you can mitigate them and take action if necessary. If you've got colleagues there, this is going to be really important when we come to looking at safety culture. Talk to your colleagues, interpreting colleagues, discuss with them what you think the safety risks are and discuss what action you need to take. You can still hear me, that's good. Um, some pictures which should help you think about how you assess your environment. Now, this is a mobile interpreting booth, so it's not actually in the conference room. The first thing I can see is the, the steps at the back of these booths. The steps are not located in line with the doors. That's an absolute classic. Now, this may seem minor. It's really important to, to remember that as an interpreter, your safety starts with even minor things. It's not okay to fall off that step, for example. You might not hurt yourself, but you might break your ankle. I've seen two interpreters that I've worked with break their ankles by stepping off a, a step on a nuclear plant. I've never seen anybody touching wood in all directions have any issue with the nuclear side of things, but I've seen two people break their ankles because they fell off a step. So this is really important. The, the, even the most minor injury, if you're at work, is not okay. Your health and safety is paramount. And things like this, where the, the, the the steps into the booths are not aligned with the doors is a, is what we call a precursor or a, or a potential accident situation, um, which if you spot it, you should try and uh, mitigate it, if only by making everybody aware of it, because it would be hard to apply a physical mitigation in this case. Moving swiftly on, this would be a different environment where you can see the speakers, but you're a long way away from them. If you're doing this on a regular basis, then eye strain would be a safety issue. Hearing could also be an issue. Things like electrical safety, fire safety, where the emergency exits are and so on would be an issue. Interview room. We've talked about interview rooms. Now you need to know where the exits are. You need to think about your positioning with regard to the client. There are lots of things here. Many of them, as I said, related to who's going to be in the room and the dynamic factors there. Um, I've talked about situational awareness. Situational awareness can the situation can change. If you're going to be aware of the situation, you need to be aware that it can change and that there may be factors which weren't there at the beginning, which may appear during an interpreting scenario. I'll come to that when we talk about the during part. This is more my environment. This is um, obviously a train, uh, what looks like a locomotive manufacturing uh, facility. There you would need to think about personal protective equipment. The person you can see standing on the shop floor doesn't have a hard hat on, for example, which is probably a breach of rules. In fact, certainly you need to think about safe walking routes. You need to be thinking about standing still when you're interpreting your position when you're interpreting and so on. So all of this is about assessing your environment at the start and then being aware of the situation. Now we go on to what your techniques are, your toolbox during interpreting. Now, you should have the things that you need to work safely. That means your personal protective equipment. So if you're in an industrial facility, the obvious ones, hard hat, eyeglass and so on. Your positioning and your posture can be crucial. I've worked with an interpreter in an office who um, was in there for a long time. He was very tall and there weren't enough chairs. So he knelt down next to the desk and he was interpreting while kneeling down, which I, I found um, unacceptable and, and told him so and made sure he got went and got a chair. He was in a team that I was leading. So that kind of posture, that kind of positioning issue can lead to safety issues. Taking breaks as well. Um, if you're an interpreting scenario where you're working on your own, uh, often obviously we work in pairs, but if you're working on your own, then you need to agree with the customer when to take breaks. That can become a safety issue because it can contribute to fatigue and stress and so on. And uh, sorry to bang on about this, but if you're more fatigued, more stressed, you're more likely to have a safety issue. You're less likely to be able to deal with the safety issue effectively. If you do have these risk factors such as noise, visibility, customer behavior, be uh, think about how you challenge them. As I said before, challenge them professionally, calmly. The interpreter getting stressed is a less effective way of dealing with the issue. If you obviously, if you need, need to take uh, uh, action, Quickly, because it's emergency, obviously, then it's less important to manage your stress and more important to resolve the situation rapidly. But generally, if you're challenging, then do it in a professional manner and talk about the outcomes. Talk about the fact that the client won't be able to communicate because you can't work safely. 
changing position. I often I find people interpreting standing on steps or trying to interpret while moving around an industrial facility, not a good idea. Your positioning needs to be, you need to be standing still. You need to be not in a dangerous situation. So you can always su suggest a change of location. Maintaining your situational awareness, we've talked about in a changing situation. If you're in any kind of environment where the situation is likely to change, just be aware that things could happen which could introduce uh, a new risk. Preventive action, if you've, we talked about identifying something before the, uh, the, the interpreting uh, assignment. During an interpreting assignment, you can also take preventive action. If you do identify a risk situation or a safety situation before it actually causes an accident, then you can take preventive action. You can say, I think we need to take action here. You can stop the interpreting if you think something is un it's unsafe enough, for you, sufficiently unsafe for you to stop the interpreting and say, there's a safety issue here for me as the interpreter we need to address it. Um, if you are unfortunate enough to be, uh, to be injured or to have an accident while you're interpreting, it's absolutely vital that you don't carry on. You need to stop and you need to seek assistance from the, from the customer immediately. I usually make a distinction between customer and client. The client is usually the person or people for whom you're interpreting. The customer is sometimes the same as the client, but often different. Often the customer is the organization which will be paying you and the client, the people for whom you're or the person for whom you're interpreting may be different. So, so that's why I often use the term customer to mean your principal, the person who is paying you, who's with whom you've signed your contract. And there's often a distinction between customer and client. They can be one of the same, but not always. So that's the during toolbox. Uh, again, nothing complicated about it. Don't build a mass, you don't need to build like Uzi Nagas, you know, a massive complicated safety structure in your head. You just need to be aware of these things. Keep it simple. Keeping it simple is the best thing. Afterwards, how are we for time? We're fine. Afterwards, in terms of taking uh, uh, immediate action, if you have had an accident or injury and it's become clear that that's happened afterwards, you may not always be aware of it during the interpreting. Um, you may have suffered some health uh, issue or some injury as a result of the interpreting which you only become aware of afterwards, then it's important to seek assistance from the customer straight away as soon as it's reasonably practicable to do so. If you've had to take action during the, an assignment um, to correct a safety problem, then speak to the customer afterwards and think about how you could prevent it from happening again. Talk to your colleagues, talk to the customer. Think about if the situation occurs again. Again, this is your toolbox. If the situation occurs again, how would we mitigate that risk? How would we prevent it from happening? But if you've already done something good, if you've taken action to correct it, and then you've spoken to the customer afterwards, that's already a good thing. I talked about near misses or precursors before. If you see something which almost caused an accident or which could cause an accident, again, speak to the customer, speak to your colleagues, work out what you could do to prevent it from happening in the future. So that's toolbox number three, what you can do afterwards. Uh, the most important thing is to talk about any safety issues that you've had. Uh, this is just to show you what a, a near miss or a potentially hazardous situation would look like. Um, it's amazing the variety of situations in which we can get ourselves, not only as interpreters, but in society in general, Thinking we're doing the right thing, thinking we're doing something good. I've got some interference there. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. It's amazing the number of situations in which we can be in a, a precursor situation where something bad could happen if things go wrong. And uh, there's a few uh, absurd examples of those here. But I'm sure you've all been in situations as interpreters where you've seen something which looks potentially unsafe. So it's important to address that if you see it before somebody gets injured. It may be a colleague of yours, it may be you, it may be the client. It's important to uh, talk about those things and address them. Now, these are some photographs which I used during a, uh, in an interpreting workshop, the kind of interpreting scenarios in which we all might be involved where we do have to think about the things which could happen. These are live interpreters, the, the, the interpreter in this uh, image. There is an interpreter in this image. Um, the interpreter in this image is the person on the right. Uh, I would uh, say that she's doing the right things. She's wearing her personal protective equipment. She's not wearing what we would have to wear these days, actually, because these days we would wear more comprehensive personal protective equipment. For when this was taken, maybe 10, 15 years ago, she was wearing the corrective, correct equipment. 
Uh, she's got safety shoes on. She's got a hard hat on. She's uh, uh, not standing with her feet across a scaffold bar. She's not holding onto the scaffolding. She uh, is. Uh, she has a clear view of the speaker, and so on and so on. So um, that is a classic kind of uh, interpreting in an in industrial scenario. But everything looks uh, obviously there are potential hazards, but everything looks uh, as safe as it can be. Okay. We got some. Inter we got some more interference. Thank you. Uh, this one is slightly more uh, niche. This is in a, a radiation-controlled area in a nuclear power plant, which is the kind of place that we that I work in. Um, again, the interpreter is uh, standing clear of the scaffolding, so she's not involved in any in what we would call an industrial safety hazards. She can see the speaker's uh, lips. She's wearing all the appropriate protective equipment. What we can't see is the radiation there. Actually, uh, there isn't, uh, I, I seem to recall from that, there was no radiation source nearby, but we can't see that. That's sometimes you has, have hazards that are invisible. Radiation is one of those where there's not much you can do um, uh, to detect it uh, with your normal senses. So you have to have other um, mitigations. You have to have other personal protective equipment in place to help you. You may have worked, some of you may have worked in industrial facilities where you do need things like oxygen detectors or explosion, explosive emitters, explosion, um, explosive atmosphere monitoring devices. Um, all of those things can help keep you safe. A more conventional office situation. Now, I happen to know in that, uh, this was uh, taken about, ooh, quite must be 20 years ago, I'm, I'm the one in the picture. Um, one of these doors led into a cupboard. So if we were thinking about it, uh, uh, egress or safe exit for in an emergency situation, then I needed to know beforehand which one of those was the cupboard to make sure that I didn't uh, uh, put myself at risk by not being able to exit the room uh, quickly enough. There are also the usual hazards in a room like this of not having any cables to trip over. And again, if you're some of you working in public, uh, public sector interpreting environments, then you know there are other factors possibly related to uh, the scenario that you would need to consider. But for me, in this situation, uh, the issues were uh, conventional office related things uh, related to the emergency exit, related to not having any tripping hazards. And again, related to things like making sure that you took breaks, making sure that we took breaks, making sure that um, I didn't put myself in a position by not knowing the subject so that I didn't stress myself, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, um, it was a good job. I wasn't working in that interpreting booth. I do do a small amount of booth work. That's a colleague of mine. I don't think I would have fitted through that door. This was the this is the kind of thing that can be challenged effectively by interpreters. Now it's very difficult to mitigate this in the moment because obviously this is a physical booth, and actually there wouldn't be time, presumably, when you turned up for the environment, when you turned up for the assignment, there wouldn't be time to change the booth. So you would have to work out. Uh, having assessed the situation, whether you were able to mitigate the risk sufficiently effectively for, for you to be able to do the work. So you'd have to think, come up with a scheme with the customer for making sure that you could exit safely if there was an emergency, for example. Um, briefly, interpreter safety culture. Now, what this is, the benefits of this are, benefits of thinking about safety and building into what you do is that you will become more aware of safety, you will increase the customer's awareness of safety, and you'll increase your colleagues' awareness, awareness of safety. Now, working for my main customer in the nuclear industry in France, they talk about shared vigilance. Shared vigilance is, is part of safety culture. If we're all looking out for each other, and we're all aware of safety all the time, as I said, we don't need to make it into a massively complex thing, we just need to build it into our thinking then we're more likely to be able to work safely and to go home uninjured at the end of the working day. So this is what safety culture is about. It's not about making things difficult for yourself. It's not about adding a layer of complexity to what you do. It's about giving yourself a better chance of staying safe. Taking responsibility for safety, often as interpreters, we feel that we don't have agency. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about interpreting agencies. I'm talking about ourselves as agents within uh, an interpreting assignment within an interpreting scenario. We are actors in our own safety. We have to be partners with everybody else in terms of safety. So we need to take responsibility. We need to be committed to it and we need to work in partnership with everybody else. A no blame approach is really important to a safety culture. 
the most important thing to resolving safety issues, and I, I, meant, I kind of touched on this before when I talked about how to address a safety issue with the customer. If we start blaming people when we do that, then we're going to address it much less effectively. A no blame culture is saying, this is the situation. I'm not blaming anybody. Obviously, there may be situations in which blame is apportionable, but leave that for afterwards. Leave that for the, the legal situation. Leave that for the cause afterwards. When you're addressing a safety situation in the moment, you need to not blame anybody. You need to say, this is the safety issue. This is what we need to do to resolve it. Sorry, I was turning around because I thought the cat was coming to jump on my desk again. So the no blame approach is really crucial. If you're speaking to the customer and to colleagues, talk about the safety situation, say what the outcome needs to be. We need to fix this so I can work safely and address it professionally and calmly. Raising safety concerns as soon as possible is really important. Again, this is about agency. If we see something unsafe, we shouldn't be scared as the interpreter to address it. Identifying resolving safety issues promptly is part of the same thing. Um, identifying them. Now, we've talked about risk assessing our environment, being uh, having a high level of situational awareness. That's what helps us identify and ultimately resolve safety issues. Integrate safety into the way you work. I've just, uh, that's what I'm touching on. That's what the whole thing is about. Continuous learning and questioning attitude are also very interesting. Questioning attitude means as soon as you see something uh, that's, uh, that's not right, that doesn't look right, we all get this now on transport in the United Kingdom. We get the uh, see it, say it sorted. That's really interesting, a questioning attitude. It's very helpful uh, as a collective, as a group of people. So as interpreters, and if we can get our clients and our customers to do the same, having a question attitude, when we see something that's not right, thinking, hmm, is that right? Asking ourselves, is that right? Is it a safety issue or a potential safety issue? Do and I, and I need to address it? Also, continuous learning. Continuous learning is very important to a safety culture because as interpreters, we are obviously learning all the time and that we can learn all the time about safety as well. We can uh, uh, when we work, go into an environment, even if we're familiar with that environment, there may be something new in the environment. There may be some safety factor we haven't considered before. We may get a new assignment where there are, uh, in a new environment, where there are safety factors we haven't considered before. We may work with a client which may, uh, who may bring in new safety factors that we hadn't considered before, particularly if we're working in public service interpreting. So continuous learning in terms of as interpreters, we should be good at that. That's something we should always be doing because we're continuously learning about our subject fields. We're continuously learning terminology. We're trying to continuously maintain, if not improve, uh, well, particularly improve our language skills. So all of those things that um, uh, we can feed into continuous learning and safety can be part of that. So as I said, the importance of safety culture is it's there to improve our safety. That's what this is all about so we've got there actually uh, I've, I'm, I'm apologies if i've if it's felt like i've zoomed through things so let's get look at what we've talked about preparing to be safe now the 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 the, the toolbox for thinking about the safety before the assignment before you even get there, so making sure you're fit and healthy. And then when you get there, before you start risk assessing the, the, the environment, risk assessing the, the scenario, the assignment, the client, all of those things are part of preparing to be safe. We can sometimes forget it because we're busy, because we're in a rush, because we have to travel. Important. Being aware of the factors that can affect your safety in the lines of defense against them. Again, it's very simple. There's a risk, there's a mitigation. If you see a risk, think about the mitigation talk to the customer about it. Don't be afraid of the term mitigation. It just means trying to reduce or eliminate the risk. Use your toolboxes. The toolboxes we talked about, it's once you've got used to thinking in terms of toolboxes, it's a term that I like. Toolbox just means having a technique, having a tactic. We all have toolboxes in life. We have toolboxes, for example, if we want to get the cat down off a high shelf, which I often have to do in this office, if we want to get our baby to sleep, if we want to make sure we don't miss the bus, we all have things we do to make sure we're able to achieve what we want to do in our personal lives. The same thing applies to interpreting. Little tactics, little tools or techniques that we can use to improve our safety in this case. So our safety toolboxes, use those before, during and after your assignments. 
and try and develop an interpreter safety culture where you're thinking about safety, not as some kind of massive add-on, not as something complex or burdensome, but just as something you think about all the time so that you can keep yourself safe because it's really important for you to go home safely at the end of the day. Thank you. As I say, I'm sorry if I bashed through it a little rapidly, um, but I hope you may have some questions. Thanks. Thanks, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Ken. Well, who would have thought that we are in such danger when we are interpreting? <laughs> that was an eye opener. Um, well, we have uh, about 15 minutes for, for questions, so please feel free. And we've got Isabella jumping. So, Isabella, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you. So, my question, maybe not, um, um, I'm not sure if this is a good question, but I'll just uh, go ahead. So, uh, sometimes it happens uh, during remote interpreting that uh, uh, parties move the device, let's say a tablet or phone, and it makes sometimes incredible noise. And then um, also sometimes when we tell them uh, that, um, you know, I cannot hear you, uh, then they move uh, so close to the mic, then we can just jump up. And I'm just thinking how to talk to them about this in the nice way so that they don't get offended because normally they are in rush, they are under pressure and then they don't want any comments, uh, they don't want any unnecessary conversations with interpreter. But sometimes it's really bad. And then obviously uh, uh, we are when we are wearing headsets, most of us in remote interpreting, and then it's really painful to get such a noise uh, into your ears. So would you like to comment on this, please? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Isabella. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, apologies for not taking more account of uh, remote interpreting. Um, I do understand how that can be a, a, an issue. I, I've occasionally come across that thing, you know, occasionally getting a great roaring sound in my headphones. Uh, it can be, uh, hearing is obviously crucially important to us, so hearing issues are important to uh, address. Are you able to, uh, to uh, well, uh, I won't come back to you immediately, but uh, my suggestion would be to try and address the issue with the customer in advance um, and do this on a systematic basis so that they become aware, so that the customers always become aware of the fact that if there is a potential for a very loud noise through your headphones. Um, as I said before, you can um, you can do it if you're doing it in advance and do it calmly and professionally and talk about the, the outcome. It's important because when you if you can't hear or if you have a, a big loud noise in your ear, you're not able to support them and, and help them communicate. So it's very important that you don't get this kind of uh, uh, disruption. So that would be my suggestion would be to talk about it beforehand and to do it systematically. Doing it during a meeting, I appreciate may be more difficult, but it is important that you do it. So if you are, if you do get that kind of loud noise through your headphones during a meeting, then, you know, it is important that you say, look, th this has just happened. And the way we can mitigate it is for you not to could come too close to the microphone or for you not to uh, move the device so that I don't get that loud noise. And then if that continues to happen, then you have to raise it again. Um, there may be some technical mitigations for that. There may be ways you can, um, that um, it's probably worth looking up if there are ways you can um, technically stop this happening by adjusting your headphones or getting the customer to adjust the way their device works. That would be something that we, it would definitely be worth uh, looking into. We have Charity now. You're muted, Charity, so we don't hear your question. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, assuming my client is a, a mental health patient and uh, he becomes very abusive and insultive, what am I going to do? 
uh, thank you, Charity. That's a good question. Thanks. Um, I, I was trying to uh, kind of refer to that uh, on a number of occasions when I talked about the in, in a public service interpreting situation, um, safety issues may come from the client. So that was the kind of thing I'm talking about, you know, clients with with health issues. Um, I haven't I don't have specific experience myself of, 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 of that kind of problem, but the um, I'm assuming that uh, on the assumption that you're not alone with the client, because that would be a, a, a much more difficult and complicated situation. So my advice would be you shouldn't be alone with the client. If you are there with the client and you're working with the client and they become abusive to you, then you have to um, involve the medical professionals and you have to step away, step back. Um, your positioning, I've talked about positioning for interpreters, very important. Your positioning should enable you to, uh, your positioning in the room should enable you to step away, exit the room or exit wherever you are if necessary, exit the area if necessary to make sure that you stay out of harm. But so the first thing is you shouldn't be alone with the client. The second, second thing is that it should be medical professionals who step in when uh, a patient becomes abusive. And insulting and if you uh, if they are not stepping in then you should be asking them for help you should be saying to them um it's the patient if assuming that they don't understand the language that the patient is speaking then you're interpreting you saying okay the patient is now becoming abusive insulting i don't feel safe it's not safe for me i'm going to step away and then the, the the medical professionals would have to take uh the appropriate action thank you thank you okay we now have sue Thank you. That was an interesting question, Charity. Um, thank, thank you, you um, very much for your talk, Ken, and um, it's been really comprehensive. And um, congratulations also to Aston on securing further funding. That's really good news. Um, my question for you, Ken, is based on um, um, a, some business site interpreting, on-site interpreting I did recently. And I asked all the usual questions up front about what the job involved and who was going to be there and so on and so on. And I was just met, you know, by fairly common in our line of work um, indifference by the agency and not really very communicative about information that I needed. And um, so in the end, you know, there was nothing more I could do either than kind of make a decision, I suppose, to go to the job or not go. So I went, but I, me being me, I did quite a lot of preparation off my own bat by looking at websites to do with the company that I was going to be interpreting at their, you know, their premises and so on. And um, when I got there, I found that the website hadn't been that um, realistic. Uh, in terms of what I was actually going to be seeing and where I was going to be going, because there were some very tasteful pictures on the website, but the reality of the site visit was quite different. So my question is, after all that, really, would you advocate, if possible, us trying to do a recce, go along and do a pre-job uh, site assessment and a walk round, if, if that is allowed? I mean, I found myself going up a ladder onto a platform to interpret a PowerPoint, you know, in steel cap boots. And I, I didn't even know about the PowerPoint till I get got there, let alone having to go up a ladder. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Sue. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, it's um, it's an interesting one. Uh, the, the, the issue of doing a, a walk down to uh, assess the safety of your of the interpreting environment beforehand is uh, is an interesting one because uh, I would always say if you can do it yes but commercially it's it's very difficult because obviously you're I'm assuming that that would be time for which one is not being paid as an interpreter so for for many interpreters uh, both in that in the commercial sense and also in the sense of the fact that they're very you know we're all very busy and, and there wouldn't be time to do it so uh, in an ideal world yes it's a great idea but uh, assuming that it's not possible then it is really important to try and get uh, as much safety information as you can from the from the from the customer or the client or both beforehand now um if that 
so I'm, and, and, and as you said you you kind of tried, tried. everything you could yeah mm. to get all that information in advance if so it, so that's the first thing in the toolbox is as we said before the preparation get all you know get information and make sure you know the information on safety from the customer if one if that information isn't forthcoming and if assuming you're not available to do uh, you're not able to do a walk down which was, would be good in my ideal world then my advice would be when you get to the facility or the location is then to uh, to use your toolbox to look at the potential risks to be aware of the situation and to be uh, challenging if there is something on safety make sure you challenge on safety often the 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 um uh, the client will be very familiar with the situation, so won't think about specific interpreting type safety mm -hmm. issues um, and won't uh, necessarily have uh, even considered telling you about the general safety stuff because they're so used to it themselves. So, you yeah. know, or if, if all if the first if the first barriers, if you like, don't work, then once you're on site, be aware and be challenging and make sure that you feel safe and 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 um, I know there is a there's a fine line sometimes because we well, we don't want to jeopardize the job by challenging too much on safety. But I, I, you know I can't, I can't stress enough how important safety is and how it, it's uh, it's not a good idea to put yourself in a dangerous situation. I hope that helps. Yes, too. thanks. That's that's really good actually on reflection. I think what I should have done is got there earlier than I did, like a good half an hour earlier, and and asked you know the site people. Oh, I know I'm early, but can I have a walk round, please, just before the job starts? That would have been really helpful. That's a good idea. Yes, um, uh, gi giving yourself to, arriving a little early to give yourself time, even if it's only to to challenge and say what kind of you know what kind of environment I'm going to go Do I need any extra protection? Do I need a hard hat? All of those things. Just challenging on that level, just arriving a bit early. That's a good idea. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. Thank you. We now have a question from Ode, if I'm right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yes, Go ahead with you. your question. We, we, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, I, I mainly work uh, for the NHS, and um, most of the times um, the customer didn't don't tell us that um, the patient has um, infectious diseases. Uh, until we found out at the end of the of the interpreting session. And in this case, um, 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 wh what to do? Uh, thanks, Ode. That's a very interesting question. I, I did. Uh, I had uh, thought a little bit about this before. Um, that's not acceptable at all, is it really, to to um, to allow you to be in contact with an infectious person without telling you beforehand. So my advice to be my advice would be when that happens and you've been made aware of it after the fact, then mention it to the to the to the customer, to the client, the, the person for whom you work in the hospital that's employing you or the individual that's booked you. Say to them that it's not acceptable and say to them you need to know in advance next time. And every time it happens, challenge it. Secondly, if you become aware during uh, an interpreting assignment that the person that you're, the client for whom you're interpreting has an infectious disease that you were not made aware of and against which you're not protected, you're not wearing personal protective equipment or whatever, you're perfectly within your rights under <laughs> under the health and safety law, and also you know in terms of your 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 need to protect yourself. You're perfectly within your rights to, to step outside and say, look, I'm not going to continue interpreting in this scenario until I'm protected. Um, so that, 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 that you know, challenging uh, after the fact, if, you, if you've interpreted already and then you find out afterwards, challenge during if it happens during. And then also next time you have an assignment with that particular um, hospital or whatever it is, ask them beforehand. Tell them you need information on whether an infectious patient is involved because you need to protect yourself. I'm assuming the medical people present will will be aware and will be able to protect themselves or will be able to take steps to to reduce the risk of infection. And you, as the interpreter, being present in the same scenario, being present in that room with the client who is uh, has the infectious disease and with the medical professional, you should be subject to the same protections as the medical protection medical professional. So challenging. Trying to find out the information before or and or during and or afterwards. 
uh, would be, and, and as I say, if it happens during taking steps to protect yourself, I hope that helps. Thank you so much. We can take a last question. I'm sure it's not your name, but you come as 3939 guest on my screen. So you know yes, who I'm you are. Fosia. Yeah, I'm Fosia. So hi, Ken. Uh, my question is also related to NHS. And um, I find it very risky because I sometimes, you know, on the phone doing consent form for the procedures, which are quite serious sometimes. And our problem is that we speak Urdu and Punjabi and Punjabi have a couple of different, not really a couple of, more than a couple of different dialects. And I've come across situations where the person on the phone is really, really elderly plus hard of hearing and I'm doing a consent for the procedure. And I have mentioned to the doctor that look, there's some disruption in the, um, the phone lines and, you know, the person is out of hearing. And I I really sometimes get really scared to use those kind of consent forms with the cust um, client who can't really hear me properly and keep, um, you know, repeating the questions. So I find these situations really, very difficult. And I always pray that, uh, you know, nothing comes up against me <laughs> later. So if you can put any shed any light on this kind of situation okay thanks uh, thanks fazia that's a really interesting question um it's if you don't mind me saying it's it's almost more of a legal issue than a than a safety issue um I, um there there was I, I i'm not a legal person as i said before i'm not in a position yeah. to give any legal advice so um the if if it, from an interp from a purely interpreting point of view what i would do there would be uh for a start i think it i in an ideal world you would be present with the person and that would be much easier assuming it happens over the telephone because that's the real reality of the world we live in that's the way it's going to have to happen <coughs> then then your strategy of talking to the doctors is the right one you need to make what i would do sure. is i would make i would make clear to the doctor if there mm -hmm. is an issue with the patient's uh, uh hearing with the patient's ability to talk to you because they're elderly, with the patient's, uh, uh, um, if you have any concerns about whether the, the information on the consent form is going to be correct or whether when it's something uh, like for a serious operation, then you do mm -hmm. need to make very clear with the medical people what the issues yeah. with interpreting are. And I would also speak to your, uh, your customer, whoever is booking you, and raise mm -hmm. that with them. Okay. because because i think as i say i think that's that's more because you clearly your presumably your 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 real concern is that something bad happens and then yeah. somebody will say somebody will say the interpreter did this exactly this, yeah so that's that's so you to what i would do there is to protect yourself from that kind of issue would be mm -hmm. again not being in a position to give legal advice because i'm not a legal person i'm not a mm -hmm. lawyer in any way i don't know any i have no legal expertise whatsoever no, i just I wanted to, to i would speak to your client I would speak to your client, your your, um, your customer rather, the person who's booking you and saying, this is the situation. What can we do between us to try and help this? And also when it happens, speak to the doctor and say, what can we do to try and mitigate it? And because then you're working towards a solution then. When you've, yeah. when you've raised it, you've raised it and you said, this is the problem. How do we find a solution to this? Because I don't think the person employing you will be very comfortable with it either. You know, I don't exactly. think the person employing you will be will be happy for the interpreter to be in, mm -hmm. to be in this kind of stressful situation. So raise it with uh, both ends, raise it with the customer and raise it with the medical people would be my advice. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. For okay. this. We are already over time, but there is a last, very last hand by Nana. So if you could uh, ask your, your question very shortly, Nana. Yeah, hello. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Nahla. Thank you so much for um, for all of the information. Actually, recently, uh, I have an issue. I have a health visitor visiting in uh, a home visit. When we enter to the place, uh, we can't easily smell the smoke. So who is living in uh, the husband? He's a smoker. So um, uh, the living room, uh, it was really hard for me. I just mentioned that to the health visitor and asked him, would you please open uh, the window? So um, we asked him to open the window and we told him there's a smoke in, in, in the living room. He refused. So in that case, uh, I uh, just decided to go to my car to get my, uh, uh, my mask. Okay. 
So I wear my mask and it was really tough for to be honest. And uh, it wasn't easy for me to spend an hour with the mask. And it was really, you know, it. I was really shocked because of his attitude. Um, and I just told him, okay, just can I leave the door open, please? Because uh, I, I can't handle it. So, yeah, when you... Um, we just uh, when you mention all of the safety issues so i try to be calm i try to control myself it wasn't easy for me to be honest and after we can say two months or three months i realized i realized that i'm in the same place and um, the guy he noticed me straight away and uh, he wasn't really happy that um, you know i'm gonna be the interpreter so I was, uh, so he said from the beginning, he said, he told that, you know, the, the health visitor, okay, I don't need this interpreter to interpret for me. So um, I informed my, my company. I told them about the issue and also I informed them about the first incident and wh what I did. They told me you did excellent and uh, I think you, you, you try to control the situation. So in the future, this is my question, and uh, so maybe it's going to be a, a good uh, uh, as advice from the beginning. Uh, I don't know. I have feeling from the beginning. I wish that I said so to the health visitor. This is a risk for my because I have an issue. Uh, uh, I'm sensitive to smoking and uh, I have an allergy. So I think I should mention that from the beginning to the um, uh, to the health visitor, and I should told her that I can't uh, finish this job. Is that my right? I can do that because of my risk of my health. Um, yeah, thanks, Nala. That's a very uh, interesting story. First of all, you did the right thing by uh, challenging the situation as soon as it arose. That was the right thing, and it sounds like you stayed calm. You suggested a uh, a mitigation for the risk, which was opening the window. You tried to mitigate it by going and getting a mask. So you did, those were the right things to do. In terms of um, saying that you you don't want to interpret for that person or in a smoky environment because you are sensitive uh, to smoke, then um, presumably the company, if you, my approach would be to speak to the company that books you and to say mm -hmm. to them, Mm -hmm. I, I, it's it's a kind of it's a kind of we talked about sometimes it's difficult to take commercial decisions like this but i would say that your safety comes first and and, mm -hmm. and i'm assuming i'm assuming that you know you you do work for for other clients where this smoking is not an issue so if it's only this mm -hmm. one client if it's yeah. only this one client i mean it, it may be other clients of course so i would say no to this the company, is yeah this is the first time to be honest and you know yeah. when you enter okay. to the door when you you know when we enter to the door we can smell uh, the yeah. environment, you know, uh, it's okay. uh, it's a smoking, so it's yeah. not. This is the first time, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's well, to in me. that, yeah, I in that case, mm -hmm. yeah, I would, I would, I would speak to the company that books you, and I would mm -hmm. mention this the issue of uh, um, sensitivity to smoke for for all of us working, not you know, anybody uh, who has to work in a smoking environment. It's not healthy, but particularly for you, if you're sensitive to smoke, then so yes, mm. I would say to the company, I'm, I'm not able to work in a smoky environment. So please mm. don't book me if there's a likelihood of being in a, if it, the smoke the environment is going to be smoky, find another mm -hmm. interpreter. If you do find yourself in a smoky environment again, then mm. try and mitigate it by the taking the steps that you did. If the mitigations don't work, and mm. it's and it's if there's a serious risk to your health, then I would mm. say step out, step outside, say to mm -hmm. the health visitor, it's not safe for me. Steph, mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you do have to, it's up mm -hmm. to you then to, to judge mm -hmm. whether it's appropriate to do that. But you're, yeah. I would say if your safety is at risk, then you can step outside. And if they have to wait and find an, another interpreter and then rebook the health visit with an interpreter, then that's mm -hmm. it, your safety comes first. And that's uh, that's more important. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken, for a very informative uh, session. There are lots of very positive comments in the, the chat. Thank you to everybody for 
uh, your questions contribution. I've put in the chat uh, a link to uh, a little survey for this session. I know I'm always about those surveys, but they are actually very useful when we have positive comments, when I'm asking for more money to organize activities, when I have nice comment to show that really, really helps. So please uh, spare a couple of minutes to, to fill those forms. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing you next month for another session. So have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.